Inverse functions, yep. So I'm going to go through a few things with inverse functions. Um, I don't know if you remember um, inverse functions, but let's first start with the notation of inverse functions. I know that you guys know f of x, right, is function notation f of x. The inverse of this function f of x looks like it almost looks like an exponent. It's an exponent of negative 1, f to the negative 1 of x. But we say f inverse of x. So these are the inverses. Um, so I can also write it like that. So y or y inverse or f of x or f, f inverse of x in function notation. Um, first thing that I want to do is to show how to find an inverse function. Okay, um, and technically what it is, and then some properties that they follow. So let's say that I have, I'll start with like a linear case. Um, so I have y is equal to 2x minus 4, and if I want to find the inverse, so I'll do steps here, the inverse of this function, the first thing you're going to do is switch your x and your y variable. Okay, if inverses are interesting because this is what, what happens. We switch our x and our y variable. So where I see y, I put x. And where I see x, I put y to find the inverse. And then you solve for y. You isolate y. So you do your algebra to isolate y. So adding 4 to both sides. I'm going to bring the 2y here. 2y is equal to x plus 4. Divide both sides by 2. And I'm going to separate it into 1 half x plus 4 over 2, which is 2. Once I solve for y, then I can replace y with the notation f inverse of x, because now I just found the inverse of this original function. So this was a quick little review of how to find inverses, right? You first switch your x and your y variable, and then you isolate your y variable, and once you isolate your y variable, you determined you found your inverse function. Now, <clears throat> I'll probably do another example later, but there are certain requirements that have to be met to be able to find an inverse. Um, obviously, you have to have a function, but the function must be a one-to-one -one function. Now, <clears throat> Let me write must be. What is a one-to-one -one function? Well, obviously, to be a function, it must pass the vertical line test, right? That's how we determine if a graph is a function. But if it's one-to-one, -one, it must also pass the horizontal line test. So if it's a function, for every x, there corresponds one y. But if it's one function, if it's one-to-one, -one, then for every y, there corresponds also an x. So um, I'm going to show this in two different ways. I'm going to show it first with the uh, ordered pairs. Make it easy. 1, 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 6. Um, and this is a function, right? because there's no repeated x with different y-coordinates. So this is a function. But even though this is a function, you see that there are repeated y-coordinates with different x-coordinates. So to be a function, it has to have only, you know, uh, representing one x-coordinate with different y-coordinates. You can't have a repeated x with different y's. But to be one-to-one, -one, it has to also only have one y-coordinate corresponding to one x. So I don't want to see repeated y's with different x's. So this one is not one-to-one, -one, it is a function. But because it's not one-to-one, -one, there is no inverse. The inverse does not exist. Uh, if, I just had a question. You said that if it's a one-to-one -one function, it'll pass the vertical and horizontal line test, but mm -hmm. I've never heard of the horizontal line test. I'll do it in a second. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. 
I want to know, looking at this, first of all, is it a function? Well, there's no repeated x with different y's, so it is a function. I'm going to do one. This is one-to-one -one notation for one-to-one. -one. Real quick, one-to-one. -one. Is it one-to-one? -one? Well, there's no repeated y with different x's, so it is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so this is how I could determine a one-to-one -one function if I'm looking at it like this. Okay, so... Um, for every x, there corresponds one y. For every y, there corresponds one x. Graphically, let's look at a couple graphs. Label, I'm going to do quick graphs, so I'm not going to make it all beautiful, but at least I'll label my x and my y. So I have, let's do, this is a square root function, and this is a parabola, quadratic function. So I'm going to ask function, one to one, function, one to one. So the first question is, is this a function? Well, to determine if it's a function, it has to pass the vertical line test. If I hold my pen vertically, it only crosses that graph once, right, that curve once, so it is a function. Is it one to one? Does it pass the horizontal line test? Well, if I were to draw a line horizontally anywhere on this graph, or hold my pen or marker horizontally, does, <laughs> does it only cross the graph once? Yes, right? Everywhere on it, it only cross the graph, crosses the graph once when I do any kind of horizontal line on this graph. So it's a one-to-one -one function. It passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So the horizontal line test is similar to the vertical. It's just horizontal instead of vertical. Um, this one, is it a function? Well, yes, it passes the vertical line test, right? Everywhere I hold something vertically, or if I draw vertical lines anywhere, it only crosses that curve once, so it's a function. Every quadratic is a function anyway. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Well, if I were to draw a um, line horizontally, um, then it crosses the graph more than once. That means that there are two y coordinates that correspond to one x coordinate, so therefore it is not a one-to-one -one function, which means that the inverse of this function does not exist. So far, so good. Does this sound familiar? Um, now, before I go into the properties, this is very important for you guys that are going to take trig. You're going to see this in trig. Restricting the domain. I just showed you a parabola on a graph. And what I'll do is I'll make it, actually, let me just shift it down a little bit just to make it not the basic parabola. Let's shift it down. I don't know, it's a negative 1. So this graph is represented by x squared minus 1, right? Vertical shift down 1. And I said that this is not 1 to 1, right? Because it does not pass the horizontal line test. But <clears throat> you'll see that you'll be able to find an inverse of a quadratic. Well, why? Because what we do is we restrict the domain. So what is the domain, right? The values of x. Let's say that I'm going to ignore half this graph. Let's say I only take this part of the graph. So now I'm only looking when x is greater than or equal to 0. So this doesn't exist anymore. Only this half of the graph exists. Now the graph is still a function, it still passes the vertical line test, but not only does it pass the vertical line test, it also now passes the horizontal line test, but only for this domain, when x is greater than or equal to 0. But now it's 1 to 1 for this restricted domain. So now I could determine the actual inverse, but only when this domain exists, only when x is greater than or equal to 0. So let's find the, dom find the inverse then. I'm going to replace, so f of x is the same thing as saying y. So I'm going to replace that with x. And I'm going to replace x with y. Switch my variables. And then I solve for y, right? Add 1 to both sides. y squared is equal to x plus 1. And then to find y, when it's y squared, I square root both sides, right? y is equal to x plus 1 under the square root. Technically, the square root property says plus or minus, right? the square root of x plus 1. <clears throat> but I'm only taking the increasing half of this parabola, so I'm only taking the positive version. So the inverse function 
is equal to the square root of x plus 1. Now I could determine the inverse of this function because I restricted the domain, I took it for a piece of the domain, but it only exists for the domain of the function when x is greater than or equal to 0. You're going to do this in trig a lot because you're going to find that your trigonometric functions do not pass the horizontal line test. So you're going to take a piece of that graph. And for trig, we take a certain piece of the graph. Everybody takes the same piece. So you have to memorize what piece of the graph you're taking. So that's sometimes tricky in trig. So this is an important concept for later on. You take a piece of the graph to create the one-to-one -one situation so that you could find the inverse. But it only exists on that domain. I'll come back to that again. So this is restricting the domain to create the inverse. So kind of like getting out of our own way, which we do sometimes in math. Um, <clears throat> so based on what we do with inverses, based on how we find inverses, you know, let's just for the heck of it, find the inverse of this. This is an easy example. This is a one-to-one -one function, so the inverse exists. Well, it's a, it's, you know, a list of ordered pairs. So how do I find the inverse? Well, I'm just going to switch my x's and my y's. I'm going to switch my x's and my y's. Oops. Got to switch them. Switch my x's and my y's. I'm going to switch my x's and my y's. Switch my x's and my y's. Switch my x's and my y's. Ah, there's my inverse. Now, there's something interesting that happens with inverse functions, okay? Um, there's certain properties that happen, properties of inverse functions, and this is something that you're going to also see later on. And I'm going to show the first property by using this, because it's a nice, easy example. The first property, well, let's do this. Let's find the domain and range of this function f. Let's find the domain. Now, because this is only a, you know, a list of ordered pairs, the domain is not an interval, right? It's a list of numbers. So what is the domain from least to greatest? All the values of x. Well, the smallest value of x is 1, then 2, then 4, then 7, right? What is my range? All the values of y. Now I can list them, so I represent them in set notation because it's not an interval. It's a list of numbers. All the values of y from least to greatest, so 0, 2, 5, and 8. Okay, not bad. Let's find the domain and range of the inverse then. Well, the domain of the inverse, again, all the values of x, though, from least to greatest, 0, 2, 5, and 8. And the range, all the values of y from least to greatest, 1, 2, 4, 7, and what do you notice? I hope that you notice that the domain of the function is the range of the inverse. Let me use a different color. Right? The domain of the function is the same as the range of the inverse. And the range of the function is the same as the domain of the inverse. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not, because to find the inverse, we switch x and y. So therefore, x represents domain, becomes y, therefore it becomes a range, and vice versa. Exactly, they switched. So the domain of a function is the range of the inverse, and the range of a function is the domain of the inverse. That is my first property. So the domain of uh, f is the same as the range of the inverse, And the range of the function is the same as the domain of the inverse. This is true for all functions and their inverses. Okay? Um, if it doesn't follow that, then you made a mistake. But you also want to consider how you restricted your domain. So, uh, let's go back to this one. Um, let me find f of x, the domain and range of f of x in white. Well, we have the graph here, right? 
of the function f of x. Remember that I restricted the domain, because normally the domain of a quadratic is from negative infinity to positive infinity, but I'm taking a specific piece of it. So I'm going from 0 to positive infinity for the domain, because I restricted it. The range of the um, well restricted function goes from negative 1 to positive infinity, including negative 1. Now I'm putting this in interval notation because it's an interval. I can't list those numbers. There's infinite many, infinitely many. I can't list them. I put it in interval notation. You use interval notation a lot as you get into higher level math. So um, if you have a question about that in a second, ask me. Write down your, write down your questions. Um, let me talk about this guy. So if I were to graph this, um, let me graph it over here. Okay, so this is the graph up here of the function y is f of x. And down here is the graph of the inverse. So I don't know if you remember, again, this is a um, square root function, and it's got a horizontal shift to the left one. So it looks like that. If I want to find the domain of this, well, it goes from negative 1 to infinity, including negative 1. If I want to find the range of this, it starts at 0 and goes up. Is it a coincidence that the domain of the function is the range of the inverse and vice versa? This should be true if I did things correct. Right? If I didn't do things correctly, then this would be wrong. Now, I mean, obviously, too, if I didn't remember that I restricted the domain, they wouldn't match. Um, here's the other interesting thing that I want to show you. Let's say that I put this graph on here. So let me erase this. Wow, it's pouring outside. Okay, so in, uh, I guess in yellow is my function, and in green I'll put my inverse, which looks like this. So this is the inverse function. This is another property of inverses. I don't know if you noticed, but if I were to take this line, y is equal to x, which goes to the origin and looks like this, these two graphs are symmetric over this line, right? If I were to take the green graph and fold it over that red line, it will land right on the yellow graph and vice versa. So this is another property of inverse functions. The function f of x and its inverse are symmetric over the line y is equal to x. That goes to the origin, right, and has a slope of 1. Every time, if that's not true, then something is wrong, right? So they're symmetric over this line. So if you were to graph a function, obviously if I didn't, if I graphed the whole parabola, that wouldn't make sense, but remember I took a piece of it, so I forgot about the rest of it. I'm only on this domain of the function. So they are symmetric over that line. There's one more property of inverses that I want to talk about. This is also important for trig. Let's see if you remember this notation. The composition of a function and its inverse, let me rewrite that so it's a little bit cleaner. f of f inverse of x is equal to x, and f inverse of f of x is also equal to x. The composition of a function and its inverse should simplify to x. If it doesn't, then your inverses are incorrect. This is also true when you get to trig, but it gets a little bit more uh, in depth when you get to trig, but that's an initial concept that you're going to use. So let me uh, do that for these two. So let me copy that down. So I have f of x was x squared, what was it, minus 1, and then I have f inverse of x was the square root of x plus one, right? Make sure. Mm -hmm. So let's test it. We're going to check to see if I found the inverses, if they're correct. So that means I have to find the composition 
in both directions. It has to work in both directions. So let's start with f of f inverse of x. So what does this mean? This is function notation. This is the input. I'm sticking into this. So if I were to, let's say, replace this f inverse of x with you know what it's equal to, the square root of x plus 1, this means that I'm taking this function and plugging it into this function. I'm replacing the x here with the inverse. So, you know, what I, what I do when I do something like this, wherever you see an x, you put parentheses and then copy the rest down. And in the parentheses, you put the new input, the square root of x plus 1. So I'm taking this and plugging it into this. That's what this means. Take the function, inverse function, and plug it into the original function. And then simplify. Well, if I take a square root and I square it, it cancels the square root, and then bring that minus 1 down, and then the plus 1 and minus 1 cancel, and it simplifies to x. But that has to also work in the other direction. So I plugged this into this, and now I have to do it in the other direction. I have to do f inverse of f of x. What does this mean? Take the function, plug it into the inverse. So f inverse of x squared minus 1. So everywhere I see an x, you could put parentheses if you want. I'm plugging this now into this. So I'm replacing the x here with x squared plus 1. And then I'm simplifying. And you can see where it's going to go. The square root of x squared. That's a minus. Taking this and plugging it into here. x squared minus 1 plus 1 is x squared under the square root. The square root of x squared is x, and therefore the composition in both directions work, and they're both simplifying to x. Um, so this is the last property of inverse functions. So first of all, if you have inverses, right, the way that you could check to see if they're inverses, you can First of all, find the composition in both directions. Plug the inverse into the original and vice versa. Plug the original into the inverse and both should simplify to x, both. Or you could graph them and see if they're symmetric over this line. Or you could find the domain and range of both and see if they match. The domain and the range, uh, the domain of the original, does it match the range of the um, inverse and vice versa? Or you could check all three. How do you find an inverse? You switch your x and y variable, and then solve for y, and then you use your proper notation for inverse. Okay, But they only exist if it passes the vertical and the horizontal line test. Are they one-to-one -one functions? For every x, there corresponds exactly one y, and for every y, there corresponds exactly one x.